So when I was 12, just about to be 13, uh, my brother Dennis, who was five years older than me, was killed in Vietnam, hit by a mortar shell uh, in Vietnam. And I can still remember, even though that's, you know, 55 years ago, um, and I don't remember how long this went on, but it feels like for months, I would every night have these dreams of somehow sneaking over to Vietnam. And so some nights the dream would be, you know, I was scampering up, you know, if you can picture one of those big transport planes and that, you know, the tail ends that have a ramp and I'd scamper up that ramp and hide or other nights I was hiding in the wheel well of an airplane or something. And just so now fast forward nine or 10 years and I'm sitting at the vineyard Anaheim for the first time as a year, very young man at the time was actually Calvary Chapel, your Belinda. And I'd been in Bible school and had met Wimber and we were beginning to visit the church and God, like all Wimber talked about was the kingdom of God. <laughs> and I remember elbowing my friend saying, if he says the phrase kingdom of God again, I'm going to poke myself in the eye with sharp <laughs> objects. Like, like what the heck? And now go forward I lose track of the exact time, but three or four years, and Debbie and I are living in Wheeling, West Virginia. We're starting our first church in 1979, and several years into that church, I don't remember how many, a family comes to me and says, Todd, we want to adopt these kids from Vietnam. Would the church help us with that? Would you help us get them here? Would you help us if we need help in the first months with food and clothing and stuff? And I said, well, yeah, duh, yeah, of course. Well, what happened in 10 years? Something that I've been trying to argue for, a reframing of what is the good and true and light and right. Because I had learned about the kingdom of God, no human being is any other way of dismissively talking about them because my whole sense of anthropology, my sense of, of ontology, my sense of being, my sense of creation, everything had been reframed by the gospel of the kingdom of God. And this is what I'm trying to say that what happened to me from the time I was 12 to converted at 19 to in the ministry immediately, but starting my first church at 23, what happened to me, I want you all to like really look me in the eye here. What happened to me can happen to people in your churches. Conversion has not gone out the door just because we live in this highly pluralistic, increasingly secular society. People still see, if they can hear it, they still see the goodness of Jesus and this thing that he was constantly on about with the kingdom of God. So I know you've all heard me. You've heard me now, like Wimber, bang on about the kingdom for some of you a lot of years. Um, I just want to take a shot at it again today from a, a different perspective in terms of how we can frame these arguments because the arguments aren't going to go away. And even the sexual revolution, whether you want to date it in the 60s, which is common to do, some people want to date the beginning of the sexual revolution in the 20s with the uh, invention of the pill, however you want to date that, it's not going away. What am I going to do the first time a wife of a clergy person calls me and says, Todd, my husband's just not intimate with me anymore in any way, and the other day I found out that in the small business that we own, that my husband has a sex doll. What am I gonna do? What does the Bible say about having sex with a doll? Nothing. Or the person who we're doing a background check on for becoming clergy and we find out about artificial intelligent sex. And what, from what I'm told, is increasingly going to be coming really real sensations for sex. Well, what am I going to do? Well, what, what would you guess I'm going to do? I'm going to try to reframe it in cross and kingdom and say, 
what are these big grand narratives? How do they help us explain what are going to be consistently growing issues? Not just in the area of human sexuality, but in areas of economics. Uh, migration and immigration is not going to go away. It's part of the reason I'm so proud of Jonathan, wherever he's sitting. I've lost track of him. There he is. Um, the world is coming to our door. That's not going to stop happening. The world is coming to lots of other people's doors. That's not going to stop happening anytime soon. These issues are not going to go away. And all, all I'm trying to say to you is we need a way to think about them. I'm not suggesting that, well, if you just have an orthodox view of the kingdom and an orthodox view of the cross, that therefore that solves every problem. Of course, I'm not that naive. I'm just simply saying we need a place to start to think about these things. And I could have chosen things like creation, the doctrine of creation. That, I suppose, would have been fine. I, maybe we could start with things like incarnation. Um, I forget what book I was reading recently where when Bart started having kind of his wake-up ideas about what was happening. Um, oh, I know. I was reading Daniel Stevenson's dissertation at Fuller. That Bart, when he, when he finally woke up, his, um, his approach to helping Nazi Germany and the church there see what was happening were these major doctrines. Like, what does incarnation mean about what God might think about Jews? Do you see what I'm saying? He, like, went back to find these big, overarching, tra transcendent ideas in order to engage faithfully as a Christian in Nazi Germany. I suppose we could take something like eschatology, you know, where's human life going? Where did God intended it to go? What's going to be its telos? We could have chosen other things. I chose cross and kingdom just as a way to say that there's a holism that's fundamental to ministry in the way of Jesus. And that that holism is then what informs things like evangelism and justice thinking and that sort of thing. I don't know if you've seen the book Bonhoeffer's Black Jesus. It tells the story of Bonhoeffer leaving Germany, coming here to the States, to, to New York, coming to Harlem, and learning from black church experience what this is all about, and then goes back to Germany and faithfully engages. And Bonhoeffer said, what matters is how one interprets Jesus. Like when you're facing these really big issues in humankind, Christians, he says, have to have a hermeneutic of Jesus. And it's that then that connects us to justice. And it's, it's that like feeling of Jesus which embeds in us empathy, which is then the ability to share in the experience of other people, to enter their context with the ability to reflect on the concrete needs for justice there. And so Bonhoeffer, as he's, this is maybe unfair, I just don't know how else to say it, when, when Bonhoeffer, when lights are coming on for Bonhoeffer, he was obviously brilliant. He says that Christianity must totally center on Jesus and that the interpretive key to, to seeing Jesus is to see Jesus hidden in suffering and identifying with the oppressed. And that then becomes our guide for social action or evangelism or discipleship. And so I just want to bring to mind a simple sentence from the New Testament, which sort of, it, it, it's symbolic of the main message of Jesus in the kingdom, Matthew 6, 33, we all know it. Seek ye first God's kingdom and his righteousness. That is a Greek term, dikaiosune. And because I'm presently writing a, a book on uh, justice, I'm just starting, um, I've been doing a lot of work on the D-I-K words in the New Testament, the root from which Dikaiosuni comes. Um, in fact, I didn't want to say this in front of Justin, but the working title in my brain is, If You Love Me, Do the Work. And the subtitle is, What Black Christians Taught Me About Seeking Justice in the Way of Jesus. There is, you could just listen to him. And you listen to him reflecting on not just the activities of the civil rights movement, but the implicit, deep, profound Christian moral ethic. It's stunning. I remember the first time I heard Tom Wright say, how does any Jew believe in God after the Holocaust? And in the last two or three years, as I've got big stacks of books in my office now, probably 25 black authors I've read in the last two or three years. I find myself saying, how does any black person love God 
after hundreds of years of chattel slavery. Stunning to me, the moral imagination. And it's rooted in this idea of dikaiosune, of these D-I-K word groups. And they mean righteousness and justice. This word cannot just, it, it's obviously like any Greek term, it, it has to be partially interpreted by its context. But for the most part, this is a really important compound word, dikaiosune which includes our personal piety very strongly, but it also implies a social goodness. So this is one of the places where I think the Amplified Bible gets this right. When Debbie and I were kids, we used to call the Amplified Bible that Bible that was really loud. <laughs> uh, I don't think anybody reads the Amplified Bible anymore, but in the Jesus movement, that was a thing. The Amplified Bible was a thing in the Jesus movement. And the Amplified Bible has it. The Dikaiosuni, it translates... Uh, um, Matthew 6, this way. Um, Seek God's way of doing and being right, the attitude and character of God. Now, that could emerge from any Greek dictionary. You just go look up the Kaosuni in any Greek dictionary, and that could have emerged right from it. It's God's way of doing and being right. So see, it's being right, personal piety, but it's also doing right, being Christians in the society that we find ourselves in and trying to align ourselves with the attitude and character of God. Well, of course, that matches up perfectly to Jesus saying, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent. Metanoete. Metanoia. Noia is the basic Greek compound, com, or cognate for thinking or cognition. And um, meta there is a prefix means something like again. The kingdom of God is here, rethink everything. And then align yourself to God's way of being and doing in the world. Other translations have this, seek first the kingdom of God and God's goodness. Or seek first the kingdom of God and put his work first. Or seek first the kingdom of God and do what God wants. Or seek first the kingdom of God and then seek that which has his approval, that which he requires of you, that which is right with him. And the oldest translation we have of the Roman Catholic Church, the Latin Vulgate, says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his justice. And everything else will be added to you. If you seek God's dikaiosune, everything else will come to you. And this is important because God's justice, God's, and the uh, Hebrew word just went out of my mind, tzadzik, And there's another one that just went out of my head that starts with an S. Some of you Hebrew scholars will remember that these things aren't abstractions. They're meant to concretely express God's mercy. And so when Jesus stands in public and says, this is the first and most important thing, to seek God's kingdom and its way of being good in the world, he's saying that the pursuit of righteousness and obeying God's will in all of its aspects, personal, social, and communal, this is to be the first priority of all God's followers. And all I'm really trying to do in my beginning talk and in this one and to say, I'm inviting you into that frame, like reframing everything about humankind is not my idea, it's Jesus's. Because once you seek first the kingdom of God, then everything else has to be organized within that frame. And everything has to be read through that frame, obviously at its best. So you may have heard me say, this is kind of a new thought to me in the last few years, that the older I get, And the more I see the complexities of faith and complexities of the church and complexities of everything social, it just feels to me like Christian spirituality maybe is a lifelong exercise in just taking Jesus seriously. And so you've all heard me teach on Mark 1, 14 and 15, you know, the the gospel of the kingdom. But think of these, I just want you to like, like imaginatively and maybe evocatively just marinate in these texts for a second. Think of the summary text all throughout the synoptics where it says Jesus went throughout the towns and villages preaching the good news of the kingdom of God. He said things like, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns also because that's why I was sent. Jesus said the law and the prophets were proclaimed until John, but since that time, the good news of the kingdom is being preached. And everyone is forcing their way into it. Or the Sermon on the Mount intentionally reframes all of human life. 
in terms of the kingdom. Jesus, when he taught his disciples to pray, said, pray thy kingdom come, thy will be done. In the sending passages in the synoptics, in Matthew 10, Luke 9, Luke 10, Jesus expressly commands his followers to proclaim the inbreaking of God's kingdom and to do the deeds of the kingdom, such as healing and deliverance. Jesus explained his own ministry in kingdom terms. He said, if you see demons being driven out, then you know the kingdom of God has come upon you. It's being made manifest. Matthew 16, he gives his first apprentices the keys to the kingdom. The parables are mostly about the kingdom. Jesus said the greatest in the kingdom is a servant leader. Think of the Olivet Discourse. The kingdom is here, but it's going to be consummated in Matthew 24. Or think of Jesus saying in Mark's gospel, the secret of the kingdom has been given to you in unmeasurable ways. And it's remarkable to me every time I think of this little passage in Acts 1-3 that it's sort of like, you know how you go to a concert and, you know, the band leaves, but you know they're going to come back, you know, for what do we call that? A, uh, a what? Yeah, they're going to come back for an encore. So, you know, that now that we live in Nashville, Debbie and I go to a lot of concerts. And so I've gotten used to, this is fake, they're coming back. Um, so like, it feels sort of like an encore. Acts 1-3, after his suffering, Jesus presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. And he appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. And this, of course, doesn't stop with Jesus. It, be, it keeps going in his first followers. So for instance, in Acts 19-8, it says that Paul entered the synagogue in Ephesus spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. And in the same way that Jesus' sense of himself is about the kingdom, we see the same thing for Paul in his life and ministry, where he says, now you know that none of you among whom I've gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. I think this is him departing from Ephesus, if I remember right. And he's saying goodbye to the elders. And he says, I know, I know you're never going to see me again, but remember what defined our relationship. Remember what we are doing together? We are trying to take Jesus serious about this thing about the inbreaking of the kingdom of God. And we are trying to align ourselves to that personally, socially, communally, trying to figure out what this all meant. And then, of course, his final words in Rome in the, uh, the last chapter of Acts Acts 28 says that Paul witnessed from morning to evening explaining about the kingdom of God and from the law of Moses and from the prophets, he tried to persuade them about Jesus and the kingdom. And the very last verses says, for two whole years, Paul stayed there in Rome in his own rented house. He welcomed all who came to see him and he proclaimed to them the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. So what we see here is Jesus is calling his first disciples to become apprentices in kingdom living. To, I can just still hear Dallas's voice saying, to derive your life from the kingdom and its rule, its reign, and to live your life in it. Learning to announce and demonstrate and embody here, I think that's Newbegin language, that reality for the sake of others. And so in a sense, I'm suggesting a really simple idea that the only grand explanatory scheme that can really carry all the entire purposes of God and meet the full needs of humanity is Jesus' gospel of the kingdom. And here, this is why I'm so grateful for Justin. I'm really not saying anything different than Justin did. I mean, when I, especially when I was younger, I don't have much of a of a commitment to political parties these days. But when I was younger, I, you know, I had a, just a sort of unthoughtful, uncritical um, um, you know, history in a certain political party. But now, like, okay, I, I, you know, I can, I don't have a beer, but I could have a, t- a chai tea latte with you and talk about something that's partisan political and just sort of for the fun of it. But man, that is not who I am. I am consciously 
day in and day out, a follower of Jesus. I'm like trying to do what I'm saying to you. I'm trying to take him serious and all the implications that has and, and, and what it asks of me to be and to do. I mean, I just don't have, if you want to talk about that, I'm, if I'm at my best, I'm going to want to talk about that through this lens or through the lens of cross, et cetera. So the world definitely has a story. There is something that's going on. Um, it's in our news feeds constantly, but it's, it's at best penultimate. It's not ultimate. It's never ultimate. What's ultimate is that the world the story has is a God story. And it's from that that we get background and plot line and daily orientation for our role in that story. Now, if, this, if what I've just said is true, I just want to walk you quickly through some implications of that so you can see what I mean by trying to reframe these things practically. If that's true, then what about culture or culture wars are the kind of things that we've been talking about with Justin? Well, if it's true that the rule and reign of God are the most true, the most real things about our world, then the church, I would want to say, is released from the culture wars and that we can trust in the slow work of God and the biblical narratives about consummation. Trust that that's going to happen. And this then, I want to say, positions us to love and listen and learn, to be good conversation partners who simultaneously hold to the revelation of God and allow others to find their way to that revelation without bullying, manipulation, or controlling behaviors. And this means that in acts of evangelism or justice or hospitality or benevolence, that we work alongside God who was always already there. Do you see how that like flattens or maybe even banishes anxiety? But if you're going into this thinking that I have to have this conversation on the terms of people who actually don't care anything about God or his kingdom, and I have to have this conversation on their partisan terms or something, well, of course we start feeling impotent. Or we just get to the place where we don't want to play. But what if we can stand there knowing that we stand there as one of God's people who's he's already on the scene? <laughs> like this is his creation and he's shepherding it to something. So the gospel of the kingdom, I want to say, creates an alternative culture. And that's the culture we live in. And that then frees us to be ambassadors of the kingdom in our various social moments and social contexts. Well, what would the kingdom say about ecclesiology? For me, the kingdom teaches us that it's the ruling and reigning of God creating this new social reality, the church, the people of the kingdom, whose God is the king. And so it's the message that Jesus embodied and announced and demonstrated that then becomes the ground zero and the North Star for the church. And it's reductionisms of the gospel of Jesus on the left or the right. Think back to trying to work your way through the divine conspiracy 20 or 25 years ago in those opening chapters where Dallas is sort of taking apart the right for the way they missed the gospel of the kingdom, taking apart the left for how they missed the gospel of the kingdom. And that's the root cause for lack of discipleship and mission. I'm hearing it said a lot today, and I think it's true. I mean, it seems true to me. I don't have any like scientific data. But it seems true to me, because as I listen to pastors all of America, I, I often am hearing this now, that my, it feels like my people are being more discipled by cable TV, talk radio, and social media than they are by the church. And how do I, how do I compete in a 20-minute message with them listening to talk radio for 30 hours a week, 20 hours a week? How, how do I compete? What do we, like, what do, we do? Uh, so I know there's something real going on there, and I think what it means is that um, um, we have to find a way to talk about a uniqueness that there is in the kingdom and how followership of the kingdom is what gives meaning to the church and that the kingdom is the dynamic of the church and that which is meant to not only just give her life but to orient her life and work. Or what if we thought about leadership? How, how might the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom, inform the way we think about leadership? Well, for me, the gospel of the kingdom calls forth leadership patterned after Jesus. 
And that kingdom leadership is really a participation in the life of our leader, Jesus, who is actually alive and is now living his life as he always did for the sake of others. So then our task as leaders is to reveal that life of Jesus, to cast vision for living in that life that Jesus is currently living, and to call people to it, to form their souls for it, to facilitate the reception of the Spirit to enable it. Well, if you were to think, how does this work with something like the doctrine of the Holy Spirit? Well, as the gospel of the kingdom is presented and it begins to take root in the life of a person or in a community, it expands and it finds its direction in the third person of the Holy Trinity. And it's the Spirit then who mediates to us the person of Jesus, right? The disciples' big fear in John 14 is they're going to be orphaned. And again, I can just say because I, I, again, I've been working with pastors my whole life, that a fundamental challenge for every pastor is to feel alone and to worry about whether staff's with me or vestry's with me or the society's with me or the church is with me and it just can feel so much like everything is aligned against us. And so we're not precisely afraid of being orphaned the way the first 11 were because Jesus is saying, I'm gonna leave you. But nevertheless, it's pretty analogous. And Jesus' answer it to them is the third person of the Holy Trinity. You will not be left orphan, orphaned, for I will send to you the paraclete. It's an incredible word that Greek scholars for you know, thousands of years have worked on. I don't know that there's any consensus about how to you know, rightly translate paraclete. Comforter, guide, you know, you, you all know the various things. Um, my favorite translation of paraclete, it's probably not like Greek, you know, precise, but is the continuator. This is what Jesus is offering them. I'm going to continue with you. And for them, whether it was Herod or Nero or the zealots who were on their case, or the Qumran who was saying, you guys are idiots, you need to come live in caves with us. Jesus was promising them that you will stay in the way of the kingdom as you stay connected to the third person of the Trinity. Now look, I know you all know that I was formerly president of the Vineyard Churches, and there's like nobody in this room probably who knows more of the good, bad, and the ugly of charismatic Pentecostal Christianity than me. And for me, this is not charismatic Christianity. This is, if you think Jesus is smart, if you trust him, then Jesus said, we live in the age of the spirit. And it's the spirit who then continues to mediate to us the goodness, the rightness of what Jesus taught. Remember, the spirit will lead you and he'll remind you of everything I taught you. Well, what did Jesus teach? We've already established the kingdom of God. And so it's the Spirit through giving us gifts or think of the fruit of the Spirit, um, think of um, the promise of, of dunamis, of power, which is simp- don't think of power negatively construed. Just think of it as capacity. You'll be given capacity to stand in this crazy broken world. You'll be given authoritarian authority, the sense of being authorized to be my people in the world. This is all kingdom stuff. Or we might think, okay, what does this have to do with spiritual formation? Well, for thousands of years now, the church has known that the actions and words of human beings don't come from nowhere. They don't arise out of the blue. They arise mostly and are animated by our desires. I know I'm not the only one who profited greatly in the last five or ten years from Jamie Smith's work. We had him somewhere, didn't we? in California, and his, his work, um, sort of popularizing Augustine, that you are what you love, that is radical stuff. And again, he's just, you know, if, if, if you go back from Jamie to Augustine, you go back from Augustine to Jesus who said, hey, what if you were a pearl merchant and you found a pearl of great price? What's your desire there? What's the current set of your will, the structure of your soul? Would you sell all your pearls to get it? That is a parable about current desire with reference to the kingdom. 
Do you see the value of the kingdom? Is it to you if you were a real estate person and you found a piece of ground where there was a treasure buried in it? Would you leverage all of your other holdings to get it? This is what Jesus wants to know about what we think about the kingdom, right? Those parables start with the kingdom of God is like. And he's, he's like checking us. He's probing. And so what, what the masters of formation have known, Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant for 2,000 years, is that we don't come to Jesus as a blank whiteboard. We come with all sorts of, others agend, all sorts of other agendas in us and a structure of desire that is not easily or intuitively lined up well with the kingdom. And so we must engage with spiritual formation so that we bring into harmony with the gospel of the kingdom, our intellect, emotions, our heart, soul, or will, all these things are in play. And what Jesus knows is that all these aspects of the human person have to be brought into alignment. Metanoete, you have to repent, you have to rethink everything, and then place your confidence in my announcement of the kingdom. And the church has always known that this occurs through a process of spiritual formation which includes the grace-based, wise, non-judgmental use of various spiritual disciplines. So then it's Jesus the person and his explication of the inbreaking of the kingdom that is meant to orient all of us, all of our work, and all of your churches. And so all I've tried to do as I've stood before Mark and Justin and standing after them and after Ashley um, is to just say that we have to keep central something that's a grounding ground and a norming norm. And there may be times where the doctrine of creation is the right thing for you to do it. Or, or as, as for Bart, incarnation was a big deal for him to understanding what was happening in Nazi Germany. So I, as I said, I sort of arbitrarily chose cross and kingdom. But in that arbitrary choice, I am trying to model something for you that's transcendent. And how God's like final word about himself and his son, like think of Colossians 1, the son is the image of the invisible God. Or think of Colossians 2, how Paul says that he was laboring in order that everybody would come to know the mystery of God, namely Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And again, to me, that's one of those sentences we could go for a weekend retreat with. Like, seriously, Paul? Like, all the treasures of God's wisdom and knowledge are in Christ? Or if you think of Hebrews 1.3, the sun is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being. Well, how was that seen? And the answer is, in a servant life, proclaiming the kingdom, giving himself to sacrificial death on a cross, and then experiencing the vindicating power of the resurrection. That's the story. That's the transcendent story through which we then deal with the little stories that we have to deal with. The real new stories that pop up from our culture every day they affect our lives, of course. They affect our congregations, of course. I'm not in any way minimizing that. I'm simply asking the question, how do we inhabit, it? How do we inhabit those stories in a redemptive way? And I'm suggesting that we do so by deriving our lives from a, from a superior story that doesn't then give us a privileged place in society. But how did we say Jesus represented himself? As a servant. Maybe I've got several places I love in the message, but maybe my favorite, one of my favorites is John, the way Peterson gets John 13. Jesus, knowing that he'd come from the intimacies of the Holy Trinity, comes into life. And knowing that God had given him all power and all authority, what did he do? Did he take a privileged position in society? No. He took off his robes, put a towel around his waist, washed his disciples' feet, including Peter, who denied him, including James and John, who are seriously screwed up, including Judas, washed their feet and said, see, I have now given you example of what power is and what power does and what it means for you to be caught up into the life of the Trinity. Right? That's the vision of the Bible, is that we're now caught up 
into the relational intimacies and the divine intentionality of the Trinity. And Jesus is saying, you're going to have a lot of dunamis, a lot of power. And you're going to have a lot of authoritarian. You actually are authorized to be my people on the earth. And so it's going to be really important that this is how you go about doing it. But of course, we know all the powers around us, not just political, but economic, all the powers around us, they don't get it. They don't really want anything to do with it. And this is where Daniel's vision in the in, um, uh, second chapter of Daniel, again, I want you to hear this in kind of an evocative way, a way that would ground your being. When Daniel sees these other political, corporate, media powers, to put it in our words, he can see that they have a kingdom of sorts and that these things have a power of a certain kind. We can't deny it. But Daniel says the God of heaven is going to set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It's going to crush all those other kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it itself will endure forever. Now, that's not a haughty, we win kind of thing. That is cosmic talk. Are you feeling me here? This isn't like, oh, we kicked their butts. Daniel is seeing the reality of the world. You all know the story of Daniel. And he sees the kingdoms of the world and then has this shocking sense that though he himself is utterly weak and his people are utterly weak, he sees that, wow, we're at a really low time of humanity. Are we? Yeah, right? Daniel, when he sees that, he sees this encouraging thing, not a bullying thing. He just sees this encouraging thing that at some point, God's will will be done. And that this then is the basis for confident ministry in troubled times. It's the end breaking and, fulfi- and the final fulfillment of the kingdom of God through the victory of the cross and resurrection. That's our story. And so cross and kingdom, these stories, they simply remind us that something else is already going on. That, as Justin said, behind, underneath, transcending election cycles, quietly there's always something running in the background, outside of the headlines. And I have this very fond memory of the... um, when the message first came out, the, the first version I saw was a little tiny paperback of just the Gospels, if I remember right. Maybe the Psalms had come out first, I can't remember. But I just remember having this little, you know, like almost immaterial little paperback of the message. And I discovered that in, before each of the books, um, Eugene had written an introduction to the books. Have you ever seen these? They're stunningly brilliant. If, if you don't have a, a paper version of the Bible, you need to buy one because you can't find these on Bible Gateway. But in Eugene's uh, introduction to the, um, Matthew and the message, he says this. And this is like, I can't tell you how much this has shaped my thinking and when I'm at my best, my being for 20 or 25 years, whenever the message first came out. He says, every day we wake up in the middle of something that's already going on and that has been going on for a long time. Geology and genealogy, history and culture, the cosmos, God. And we are neither accidental nor incidental to this story. It's from this story that we get orientation, briefing, background, and reassurance. Eugene says, lacking such a context, we're in danger of seeing Jesus as a mere diversion from the concerns announced on our news feeds. And nothing, of course, could be further from the truth. And one of the things that has been so freeing to me about that over the last couple of decades is that I don't have to make anything happen. Now, I'm an old jock. When I was eight, nine, 10 years old, I was literally charting every at bat. I mean, that's how focused I was on achievement, on being great, on getting things right. And so it was one of those places where I didn't come to Jesus with a blank whiteboard. Are you feeling me? I came to Jesus with lots of perfectionism and achievement-oriented kind of stuff. And it's not that that's all bad, but I had to come to see that, wow, I wake up every morning in the middle of something that's already going on. Can you see how that would just free me to say, okay, how do I get into that? 
And so if you experience me, and I'm sure 99% of you would say this, you, you experience me as being non-controlling, thank you, Gene. Like, I just don't have to get anything from you or out of you. I'm free to come alongside you and try to help you discern what God's doing in your world. You're not a pawn in my little game. I'm not trying to build something through you. I'm trying to be what I'm trying to practice what I preach. To be a servant to this thing that's already going on, that begins, as you always hear me say, in pre creation intentionality. Go for a retreat with that. Pre creation intentionality. Why did God create? And as soon as you say, I, win, I want in on that, well, that will start destroying selfishness. Never perfectly, but are you feeling me here? And then if you think this story with all its ups and downs has a telos, a completion, a fulfillment, where everything is perfect, and there's no more tears, no more crying, no more pain, as soon as you see that story and say you want in on it, well, that's going to start shaping your life. And it means then I become a servant to that story. And it means it gives me at least the possibility to not be a user gives me the possibility to not be a manipulator or a bully. Again, it doesn't mean we're perfect in this, but at least we have the possibility when we see it that way. So you've all heard me say before, probably, that whatever's going on in culture, God is not stumped. He is not pacing the golden streets of heaven. His anthropomorphic head held in his anthropomorphic hands saying, oh, myself. <laughs> I didn't anticipate Foucault. Who's Derrida? And what's this Rorty guy saying that my text has no meaning? Like, seriously, you think God is stumped by textual criticism? Like, you think he's up there going, what the hell? <laughs> or saying, oh, man, I didn't anticipate a time would come when human beings would be would be." confused about things around sexuality and gender. God is not stumped. Listen, you are members of the kingdom. You are ambassadors of that kingdom. And the kingdom of God is never at risk. America might be at risk. The theory of democracy might come at risk. There could be an uptake in Marxism or communism or Leninism or whatever. Sure, those kind of things could happen. But you're members of the kingdom. And that which you are most loyal to is never at risk. How could it be? How could the kingdom ever be at risk? Just think of the verb form of basileia. It means to rule and reign. It, it's, it's simply the expression of who God is. It's the spaces and the kingdom is simply the spaces and places in which what God wants to, have to happen happens. And this is why Jesus says, pray in whatever setting you're in, that the kingdom of God would come. And that's based on how it would be your name. How it would be your pre-creation intentionality. How it would be the telos of what you intend. And now let it come. God is not nervous about the outcome of creation. And therefore, we then can stand as confident, non-nervous, gentle, kind people with the orthodoxy that like Justin has been describing, mixed with the love. Just think of Jesus. He wasn't unorthodox about his father, but could walk with anybody. I don't know if I'll ever get around to writing this book. I outlined it once. I probably won't. But I, I just have always wanted to write a book about the conversations of Jesus. Because I'm just so fascinated by how about Jesus always met people on their terms. So Nicodemus, oh, you're a ruler of the people here, but you don't get what's happening. All right, let's talk. Or the woman at the well meets her exactly on her terms. Zacchaeus meets him exactly on his terms. Why? Why was he this non-nervous, deeply present presence? Because he was emerging out of a story that he knew was not up for grabs. Peter, Peter, put away your sword. I'm not nervous here. 
This, what's happening here has meaning. It's, it's a part of this big, grand narrative. And so the way the writer of Hebrews puts it is that when we see this, we become thankful, reverent, and in awe. When we, Hebrews 12, when we see Hebrews 1, that the sun is the spitten image of everything God's up to in the cosmos, when we get it, we become thankful, reverent, and in awe of that story. It reframes everything and begins to reshape everything about us. All right, I'd like to ask you to stand, if you would, please. And I just want to take a few moments. We can linger a little bit here. We, we're not in a rush. <clears throat> and I want to bless you. My dear ones, my faithful sisters and brothers, hear the truth. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Be at peace, my dear ones. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. Be at peace. The peace of the Lord come to you. A quiet, gentle, centeredness come to you. Greater is the work of God in your soul, in the work of your hands. There's much more power there than there is in the evil at foot in the world. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So at this difficult time in church and culture, hear Jesus say to you, maybe try to picture the scene in John 20, and hear Jesus say to you, my dear ones, peace be with you. In this world, you're going to have tribulation but I've given you a kind of peace that will allow you to transcend that story so that you can stand in it as my servants. Peace be with you. And then hear Jesus say, go. Go, as the Father sent me, so I send you. In that very same way that I came from the intimacies of the Trinity to the depths of this earth, so I send you from intimacy with me, deriving your life in and through the kingdom, I now fling you out into the world in all your various spaces and places, your roles and job descriptions, your cities, as the Father sent Jesus, so Jesus sends you. And now may you be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. May you receive both the capacity and character of God. May the Spirit be alive in you, body, soul, and spirit. May he animate and energize and empower your living and your work. And let these blessings free us from fearful, defensive, and angry interactions. And rather fund in us a joyous, humble, winsome, and confident engagement with our world. Amen. Bless you all. We made it through three days. Thank you. So glad you came. Peace to you. Thank you.